<laughs> it's uh, great, great to be with you all and learning with you again. So our topic today is a higher mathematical adventure into the Rosicrucian teachings. And on this top, on this topic, I want to show you first uh, something from the from the Middle Ages er, earlier in time. Um, it's a diagram of, from the Hortus Delicarium uh, in the Latin or in the, the translated English, the Garden of Delights is a medieval encyclopedia. It was a manuscript uh, compiled by Herod of Landsberg. Um, and in one of the pages there, uh, which we've been able to reconstruct, uh, she had a diagram of these seven liberal arts. Persona side is female figures. And at the center is, is the uh, queen of wisdom. Below is Socrates and Plato. Um, and we have uh, the four, four evangelists of the four gospels. But part of the idea here was that wisdom would pour forth into knowledge and understanding for humans. And these individual disciplines like geometry or arithmetic or astronomy or music, they were to be guided by wisdom and they would inform wisdom. And you notice the radial symmetry about here. Just like we have in our own lives, we learn various laws and principles and skills and disciplines but we needed to be guided by, by wisdom to use those in a compassionate and responsible way. I want you to bear this idea in mind as we move particularly through geometry and arithmetic and its modern day expansions uh, to look at it in its mystical aspects and what it's got to do with wisdom and how these things are used wisely and not destructively, but constructively. Now to um, prepare ourselves uh, for this, we're gonna do uh, a period of meditation as is our practice. So just take some time now. Uh, you may wish to take a good look at the diagram and see how there's the enthroned wisdom. Uh, we want to, in our meditation, rise to the embrace the, fi the figure of wisdom. And that's the, our deepest part of ourselves. Um, once you've got a good sense of the, uh, of the image and it's beautiful, beauty. It's sort of like a sacred cos psychocosmogram or sacred diagram. Just close your eyes and just take time to let go of the cares of the day, even where you are or who you are, if uh, you're comfortable with that. And just follow with the law of vibration, the rhythm of your breath. The rhythm of our breath allows us to attune with the cosmic and be in harmony with our environment and all things in nature that manifest through vibration. Just keep taking some deep neutral breaths, neither holding the inhalation or holding the exhalation. Just enjoy the beauty of the temple. It is your mortal frame, housing the, the holy master, the master within, our deepest guide in life, connected to the divine. And if you find your mind wandering, just lovingly and gently bring it back to the concentration on the breath. In a way, the action of the breath enlivens the cosmic essence, the vital life force in our body. You may feel a beautiful tingling throughout your body. It's very enriching and ennobling. And the concentration on the breath, in a way, stills our outer nature and allows our inner self, our deepest nature, to rise to the throne of wisdom is always with us, the center of our being and who we truly are. And as we rise to the throne of wisdom, you may be aware of the beautiful music and harmony of the spheres angels singing.
Now soon we'll conclude our meditation. Grateful for this opportunity for we realize our connection with the divine within. And when you're ready, slowly but surely, you focus yourself to be balanced with the various phases of consciousness. They're all part of the cosmic consciousness. Our objective, subjective, the subconscious, and the cosmic consciousness. And when you're ready, you may wish to stretch and open your eyes and be ready for the work and worship of the day. The Rosicrucians say, so mote it be to refer to, so be it in truth. So we can say it together now, so mote it be. <clears throat> okay. Great. So just before we enter into the main part of our presentation, I just wanted to go over a little bit of the phases of consciousness that we were using in this presentation. And this is a diagram, the Rosicrucian schematic diagram of the mind. And you'll see there's the external world, the objective consciousness, the subjective consciousness, the subconscious and the overarching cosmic, which is all natural and spiritual laws. It's a divine intelligence back uh, of the cosmos and it refers also to in this diagram the cosmic consciousness which, which is imbued in all these it's just essentially one consciousness is all the cosmic consciousness but has different phases of expression in the subconscious in a subjective and objective way we use the objective conscious to take in sights and sounds and impressions like hearing my voice at this time or seeing this diagram the subjective consciousness it has various duties or jobs to with deductive reasoning go from general principium, principles like axioms and mathematics to make deductions through logic to uh, specific uh, instances of, uh, of truth. There's also inductive reasoning done there to go from general, from data to, to uh, information to come to more general conclusions. Um, there's a variety of other functions that are talked about through Rosicrucian teachings. The subconscious is where our habits are like laws, where our dreams arise. The subconscious works with the deductive reasoning um, and given to it through uh, suggestion. And then we have the cosmic consciousness, which takes in all of this and guides all of this and is part and parcel with all these forms of consciousness, because truly there's only one consciousness, the cosmic consciousness having different expressions. Now, in regard to mathematics, the subject for today in our higher mathematical adventure into the Rosicrucian teachings. It's interesting to note that uh, some of the challenges that our different aspects of ourselves get into can come about uh, when we try to do things with them that they were never designed or wasn't their job to do. When each phrase is parts of these consciousness do as they've been intended, then in a harmonious way, then we have self-mastery. Now, for example, uh, if we try to guide our lives just with this outer self, which is situated in this point, in these, uh, the outer shell, so to speak, associated with the objective consciousness, the subjective consciousness, and the degree the subconscious, um, it was never designed or not its job to guide us through life. It really needs the cosmic impressions of the, of the master within to do that. Similarly, the concept of the infinite, which is in mathematics, but also in mysticism gently, generally, when we try to grasp it with our outer self, we'll tend to arrive in confusion or conundrums or not really get a full sense of how, how it works. And we'll see that happening in the higher mathematics as well and we're about to show you. Also, you know, visualizing um, dimensions, length, width, and height, like in, in your room where you are, for example, in the space you are, uh, we can readily do, we practice it, we can, um, get very good at it for when we close your eyes and do visualization to create things. But when we go beyond three dimensions into the fourth dimension, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, 
it gets much more challenging even for the best uh, mathematician to try to visualize four dimensions and above. But this is something the inner nature can do and do with ease and the cosmic consciousness is fully familiar with. There's also another thing that uh, we've learned uh, in more recent mathematics film, the concept of self-reference. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's where when we stand back and look at ourselves or refer to ourselves, that's something that the outer nature can do partly, but it has, it has nowhere near the capacity that our inner guide uh, can do for us. It's striking in that regard that the renowned psychologist, um, Carl Gustav Jung mentioned that with his patients, he said in the final analysis, the solution of resolving the challenges in their life was seeing things from a, from a higher level or a more embracing or a meta level. And this is something we see this happen in modern mathematics. And this is where our inner nature can help guide our outer nature. <clears throat> You know, part of the inspiration for this meditation is the traditional Rosicrucian Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. They talk about numbers as being the basis of all. And in some ways, we've seen this all the more in our modern period with all increasing digitization of various phenomena through computers and the mathematization of, ma of biology through protein, examining a protein structure or the DNA. And we see it trem tremendously so in physics and chemistry getting more and more mathematical. Um, you know, they saw spiritual philosophy embedded in both a quantitative and qualitative way in number, particularly the holy tetractors, the first 10 numbers, one up to 10. So in the spirit of Pythagoreans, let's, let's continue. You know, an important thing in our life is change. We saw the law of change. There's a dynamic action of change within us and about us and all our relations with, our, with others and with ourselves and our body uh, and our contact with our deeper nature and also our environment. And it's quite in striking in this regard that uh, there was two traditional Rosicrucians here, Gottfried Leibniz and Sir Isaac Newton who developed the calculus, particularly what was called the differential calculus to look at <clears throat> rates of change. We're very familiar with rates of change. For example, if you're running or in <clears throat> walking or in your car and the distance you go with respect to time, that's your speed. Well, that's, that's what is called a derivative in calculus. And it's expressed in more technically here, for example, uh, dy by dx. This is an all embracing concept on if you wanna deeply understand the law of change, whether it be how lightning go moves, how the, how the wave actions occur, phenomena and weathers, mo modeling of various aspects of humans, humans' life path and sociology, uh, tremendous range of things, the capacity for us to be able to even meet on the Zoom meetings and applying, cal applying calculus. And it's something very special. One has to have a deeper understanding of the law of change, but uh, the uh, differential calculus is, is one of the great ways uh, to do that. Now, one could say with a lot of this mathematics, well, do I really need to know that? Well, for, it's, it's, your, it's your decision, but it's fortunate, we're very fortunate for the world that uh, uh, Leibniz and Newton and, and uh, um, Einstein and others took up the subject and we're all the richer, richer for it. You know, related to these uh, law of change uh, is how it occurs in three dimensions, 3D, 4D and higher dimensions. And in a Pythagorean inspired text, befitting for our Pythagorean presentation today, Plato's Timaeus, he talks about the creation of the universe as a mathematical act. And he uses uh, the five platonic solids that you'll see here, the dodecahedron, the octahedron, the cube, or that technically the hexahedron, the tetrahedron, and the isosahedron. Now these are what technically are known as five finite because they're, they're enclosed, they're convex, they turn in on themselves and they're regular because they have equal sides and equal angles at each of their vertices. And there's only five of those particular type of uh, regular polyhedra. There's other regular polyhedra in general, but these particular type. And they're associated with earth, air, fire and water. So you can see, and the quintessence and the universe. 
and symbolized with the fivefold nature of the human being from a diagram from Sri Rosa Krishna Agrippa here. One may think, well, can there further insights we can get in higher dimensions from this as well? Say, are there um, finite convex or, or the equivalent of platonic solids in 4D or 5D or 6D? In 4D there are, there's actually six of them. In uh, 5D, there's actually three of them. And you wonder, well, how about in a thousand dimensions? You can imagine that. Yes, there's just three there. Actually, when you go from five and above, there's only three of them. Now to um, motivate this further in mysticism, we're looking at a sculpture here called the Octocube. It's actually on display at Eberly College of Science at Penn State uh, University. It was designed there by a mathematician named uh, and Professor uh, Adrian Ock New New. And it was built by staff of the Engineering Services Department there and completed in 2005. It was made actually as a memorial to from a, a math grad from Penn State who passed through transition or passed away uh, at the time of the 9-11 uh, attack. And here's a close of it in stainless steel. It's a beautiful work of craftsmanship. It's actually be thought of as, it's a four dimensional object called the octocube or the 24 cell. It's an equivalent of a platonic solid in the four dimensions. In a way it's like seeing a shadow from the four dimensions projected into space here. Just like in a way we can think of ourselves as a shadow from higher dimensions. The octocube is also referred to as a 24 cell. I'm just gonna go for a moment into the uh, uh, slideshow mode here so you can actually see the 24 uh, cell or the octocube being rotated uh, in its three-dimensional shadow here. So you can see here we're getting to look at it from different points of view. It's like a, like a, a jewel. This is another way of projecting into from four dimensions um, the octocube. This is one way to look at it. And over here, I've been showing you that's another way to look at it. Very, very beautiful, very inspiring entity. So let's go, go back here. Now to bring this into understanding a little more, thinking, well, shadows of higher dimensions. Let's think about this a little more. I think probably you've folded up a box sometimes and maybe of cardboard or unfolded a box that you've received a gift in and you unfold it and lo and behold, in two dimensions, it's like a cross. You can, unf or if you fold up this two dimensional cross, it's made up of squares, count them up. There are six squares. You fold them up, you get a 3D. Well, this is a little bit like the, uh, like the um, working with a four dimensional object, there's a hypercube or a cube, four dimensions. If you unfold it, just like unfolding a 3D cube, you get a cross not of squares, but a cross of cubes. Um, and another way to look at this to project this or unfold it or project it from higher dimensional, four dimensional space is to look at it like, like this, also known as a tesseract. One way to get an idea, I've talked about shadows. If you did a little experiment, say you took a wire model of a cube and you turn out the lights in the room but had a flashlight on and projected uh, the shadow. So going from 3D to the floor, which is a two dimensional space, you'd get an, uh, a geometric diagram that looks like this. The bigger square out here is, is the top square face of the cube. This lower, lower one down here is that smaller square square here. And these sides are these diagonals going off. Similarly, if you could project uh, a shadow from four dimensions uh, into three dimensions of a cube or the hypercube, you'd get something that looks like this. You know, when I first saw this, it's, it struck me that when I was a child doing science experiments, I formed uh, a wire model of a cube and I dipped it into a soapy solution and the soap film will actually form a surface like 
the uh, tesseract in three, three dimensions, as you'll see here, because the soapy film is trying to take up the least surface area. And as it moves to that, it can take on, on this shape here. Maybe this shape of the hypercube reminds you of a work of art. Salvador Dali, who was an inspired artist and very interested in integrating spirituality, mysticism, and mathematics, um, used the idea of the hypercube projected into three space to form a cross for the crucifixion of the Christ figure, the master Yeheshua. Here we see model, a, a model based on his wife actually looking up uh, in adoration at the, the master. You notice projected down on the on the planes that's here, you see the setting sun and the clouds, but we also see a checkerboard or a chessboard. And the shadow projected down here in two dimensions is a two dimensional cross form of the 3D hypercube cross. This idea of looking at the hypercube in a way is using art and spirituality and mathematics to suggest they're transcendent. They're going to a higher level of dimension and being uh, where our inner self and cosmic consciousness uh, uh, can be said to reside. It's interesting that this work that's called the uh, Corpus Hypercutus in the Latin or the, um, the um, body of hypercube or work of the hypercube has as a subtitle, which is often not mentioned, it's based on a treatise on cubic form by Juan de Hera, which is a builder of the Iscario um, monastery. It's very interesting that, that uh, Juan de Hera uh, was a uh, mystically inclined architect. Um, and he was inspired by a work on the cubic form as um, Salvador Dali's was by the traditional Rosicrucian Raymond Lull, whose work as well was to unite art, science, religion, religion. Now let's think a little bit more about higher dimensions and how these concepts in mathematics can help us to have a deeper sense of what it is to uh, be a spiritual being in a material form or material body. Um, you know, we do talk about the higher dimensions in the Rosicrucian teachings. We're used to width, length, and height, like in the room, maybe more abstractly, the X, Z, and Y, you might remember from high school mathematics. But Einstein is pictured here he spoke of a four-dimensional four space, a space-time continuum, which is not only the width, the length, and the height, or the x, z, and y coordinates, but also t, time. <clears throat> In our Rosicrucian tradition, uh, we also talk about uh, uh, v, or the rate of vibration. Um, so in a particular location in space, maybe a part of a table or an atom within yourself, it has a rate of vibration. And so in mathematics, the fourth dimension could be, could, be, could be anything. I work, for example, in various health studies, and it can be very char various characteristics of, uh, of one, you know, one's blood pressure, one's heart rate, one's heart rate variability, one's weight, one's gender. These can all be used as um, uh, dimensions in higher dimensional space. But you can see uh, in physics, in the modern physics in particular, fourth dimension is time. Rosicrucian teachings, for example, I recall an article by Dr. A. Spencer Lunt, you thought of the rate of vibration of something as a fourth dimension. But you could combine those to say, okay, we have our width, length, height, we have our time, and we have our rate of vibration. And we could use V as a single number, or sometimes vibrations are very complex, so we might want to use even more than one uh, uh, number or dimension for vibration. This is something that we're uh, familiar with through the cosmic keyboard. And the, think of the law of vibration. The, think of a keyboard that extends indefinitely. Um, with with very low to rates of vibration, one cycle per second or one hertz, two hertz, but moving up to a thousand hertz or a thousand cycles per second, going up faster and faster rates of vibrations could be higher, smaller size of the vibrations and their, it's called their amplitude. Uh, we also can think of this uh, uh, cosmic keyboard 
by a work by that title by the inspired Rosicrucian artist Nicomendes Gomez. You see here is the cosmic keyboard. We see the human here in the microcosm and all the vibrational phenomena throughout the cosmos and uh, uh, beyond into the transcendental immaterial realm. One thing about mathematics that can help us is it's many vibrations aren't just simple, simple waves. You may remember from high school, you talked about sines and cosines and you may wonder, when is that trigonometry ever gonna get used? Well, uh, it's getting used right now. And this is a way that we can have a deeper understanding of how we're vibrational beings and how uh, to understand the cosmic keyboard is applied in our life. You know, in self-mastery in a way where we're like musicians playing that cosmic keyboard, we can reach to the particular keys or rates of vibration that we need for, for different laws and balances in our life. And if we need to reach out and help the metaphysical aid to others and so forth. Sometimes you'll have a little more complex vibration that looks like a wave like this that goes down and then up a bit and then down even more and then rises up way up, down a little bit. And these are used to make all sorts of different shapes and phenomena that are around us like a, a table or the sound of my voice, uh, for example. It's not just, a, it can be a simple wave like this, but it actually bails down to two simple waves like this when they're added together. This one's got a higher rate of frequency because it's going up and down quicker. This is going across time here. But you add these two together, you get this. More complex shape and vi vibrational phenomena. This is something that's called for based on something called Fourier series in mathematics. I know some of you studied engineering or physics or applied math or pure math. You've, you've studied uh, Fourier series. You can see that uh, we've added up these two, two waves here. They give this more complicated wave. Now, this is something that uh, can be taken to uh, two dimensions as well. You may remember these Chaldney diagrams after the uh, uh, physicist, physicist Ernest Chaldney. Um, and this diagram you remember, may remember from the Rosicrucian manual. Here's a diagram. If you take the experiment is you take a, a solid or plate could be made out of uh, um, stainless steel or some other uh, copper and you draw a violin bow down it while it's held stiff in the center and you can place your fingers at various points to dampen vibrations. And if you have on it sand or some other particular substance like uh, sugar or salt that the sprayed over it in a seeming random fashion as you it vibrates, it'll form geometric forms. The vibrations of the plate will take on a geometric form. And this is where vibrations are in two dimensions. And they can take on a variety of different forms like this. Um, the Rosicrucian, uh, Erwin Wathemeyer used to uh, demonstrate this uh, experiment uh, in his Rosequa University uh, classes, actually. But you could think of this as vibrations are not only in two dimensions, but also three dimensions or four dimensions all around you. In a way, you can think of um, when you send metaphysical aid or the uh, brain, brain waves in your, within your brain, they're, they're vibrating and sending out these geometric patterns in one and two dimensions, three dimensions uh, and, and, and beyond uh, uh, like, like this. And doing these types of experiments, working out from two dimension, three dimension, gives us a little more sense of what it is uh, to be a physical and spiritual being. Now, Let's consider something related to this, another law, the law of correspondence. You know, sometimes it's said the hermetic principle, as above, so below. In mathematics, we can call that a many to one mapping because there's many of us being mapped to say the one divine archetype, for example. Um, you remember uh, when we talked about the temple before, about the law of correspondence. You could say temples, are all based on one divine archetype in the platonic sense. And they give uh, in a Mac, they give rise to the body, which is a microcosm and it is a temple. But also ideally, the divine temple is mirrored in the built temple, such as here, the grand temple at Rosicrucian Park, or 
that divine temple gives rise to a phenomena that is the entirety of the universe in the way the microcosm uh, is mirrored in the macrocosm. And you sometimes use the term mesocosm to be intermediary of between the microcosm and the macrocosm, but you could use the, the term microcosm here as well. But you see, um, if we think about a mapping from many human beings to the one divine archetype we, we give rise to, or the many temples to the one spiritual temple, or the universe to the one inner cosmic temple, the temple of God, that um, we're mapping from many things here to one, a many to one mapping. They're all based on this one fund fundamental entity. Also from as above, Slobo, there's the spiritual is mirrored in the physical. There's sort of a mapping or a correspondence there between, between the two. To try to draw this out a little bit more for you and try to keep things to a technical minimum um, for us. You may remember from high school the complex numbers, but if you don't, that's okay. I think you remember real numbers like uh, 1.75 and 2.34, or they may have many decimal places in them. Well, think about these two A letters, A and B here, as real numbers, like this could be 1.74, and this could be 1.56, and so forth. If we add them together by adding A plus BI, where I is said to be the square root of negative one. And now that can seem rather surprising. That's why it's called an imaginary number. I squared is just negative one. What this means is we construct complex numbers that way. So this complex number is actually made up of two real numbers, A and B. And what we can do with that is we can use A to say, oh, that's our length or in, the, or in a plane, how far are we moving in a horizontal direction? And B to say, tell us, how far are we moving in a vertical direction? Ah, so now we can plot this number, not as a point, as a point in a plane, because it has both um, a length and a height. And if you're familiar at all with fractal curves that have a uh, repeating structure or form in them, I'll show you one in a moment. We can think of Z here as the, our first complex number, we're going to create a bunch of complex numbers and plot them in the plane. We're going to start off with the first one just being z zero. Um, no, no, can be deemed as not having an imaginary part in that sense. And we're going to go and create a, uh, another one, a second one, a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one. So, and so when we've got, say, n of them, which could be one, two, three, four, or five, we can create always the next one. So you go from the zero one to the first one, or the first one to the second one we create. What we do is we, we square it. If it was a real number like two squared, it could be four. And then we add another number, a complex number. And these c's here, if these are complex numbers, they look like a plus bi. These we can plot in a plane because they have two components, or two real components, a height, a length, and a height. And depending what we start with here, what can happen is these, these numbers, these z's, can get larger and larger as n gets larger and larger as we do our first one, third one, fourth one, fifth one recursively. They can get larger and larger, and some will tend to infinity, and those we plot. And that gives us something called the Buddha brought, which I'll show you in a moment. If we didn't plot those ones, but the ones that didn't tend to infinity, we create with something called the Mandelbrot set which is a fractal. And it's named after Benoit uh, Mandelbrot, uh, who started developing the Mandelbrot, who developed the Mandelbrot in 1980. Here's what happens if you do enough of these complex numbers that tend off to infinity by this recursive formula. If you do enough of these Cs that we add to and try out different combinations, you get something that looks like this. And by the creator of this, who was Melinda Green, the first described in 1993, she colored it in a way that depending on those C points that get plotted here in the plane, how fast they're tending to infinity, uh, you color, do them in different shades of gray, you get a figure here that some thought looked a lot like the Buddha. And it has, uh, in essential terms, infinite structure to it. And it's infinite extent and infinite detail. You can zoom in on it and you can see more structure. 
you can also color it differently like this. And as you zoom in on different parts, because some think it, look, it looks like a seated Buddha. And if you zoom in on the heart here or in what some would call the, uh, where the pineal gland is or in the Eastern tradition, the uh, crown chakra, you see here, here for the heart, crown chakra. And as this tremendous infinite detail of Buddha's body has infinite variety in it. It's been formed by points that go off, befittingly tend off to infinity. Another way it can be pictured is some what's called the nebula brought, where it's being colored uh, partly scientifically and partly artistically based on the way that nebula are colored by astronomers. And it gives a sense uh, of something of a cosmic significance. In a way, you can think of this as an entity that is in some senses far more vast than our universe because this has infinite extent and infinite detail in it. When, I wanted you to have a little more emotional experience of the Buddha brought because when the intellect and the emotions are brought together in a perfect blend, then we have a, a deep experience of initiation or spirituality. I'm gonna show you a few more things before we finish up. I wanna to talk to you some about the law of balance. It's very important to have in our lives, emotion, our, our uh, reasoning, our emotions, psychic nature, physical nature, and overall spiritual nature. Here you'll see depicted the labyrinth at uh, Rosicrucian Park in San Jose, California. And you'll notice as you go in it, you weave around and weave around, you come into towards the center, and then lo and behold, you go out from the center. Indeed, you know, it's stated in the quest of the Holy Grail, that dates from 1225 in the medieval period, that uh, in that text itself follows the uh, labyrinth pattern and it veils various esoteric laws and principles that says, and I quote, you were once closer to it than you are today. And yet you are closer now than you were before. If you hold fast to what you have embarked on. And that's part of why walking a labyrinth mirrors our life and it can be a walking meditation. Now, there's a great deal of system and order uh, in a labyrinth that our inner, that our inner nature uh, experiences. You can think of it, for example, uh, this, this labyrinth as being concentric circles. This path, the, uh, the first path in is like one concentric circle. Uh, it's been cut off where the turns are but it forms like a concentric ring there. And then the second path in forms another concentric ring. And the third path in forms another concentric ring. And we can count them up with zero being the outside, the exterior. That first ring turns around here, but if it had been in designing it, it would have continued all the way around. The second ring in, third ring in, fourth ring in, fifth ring in, and sixth, and going all, all the way in. You notice that that's, so we can count those up. And also you notice the structure here, there's a quadrant here, a quadrant over here has twists and turns, another quadrant with twists and turns, and, and the twists and turns. The twists and turns are really made up of four sections, often traditionally associated with the four quarters of the world or the four directions, as a labyrinth, as a microcosm, as a macrocosm, as we are when we walk it. And you'll notice then that when you walk the labyrinth, our inner nature has a deeper understanding. It gets a sense of the inner order. But to some extent, the outer nature, you'd be aware of that. And one way to bring that out more deeply is that uh, we can see that as we walk in the labyrinth here, we start from zero, the exterior. Three, we go to the third ring. We'll record that as three with a purple area here. Then we come around to the second ring and then back to the first, you see? So second, first, and first we follow all the way around to go to the, the second quadrant or the green quadrant. And we come to two again, third ring, the fourth ring, the fifth ring, all the way up here and come around. That takes us to here. We come around now to the third with the, with the uh, brownish ring, fourth ring, third ring, two, second ring, first ring. So that's go four, three, two, one. Come around here, still on one, and back to two in the, the red quadrant, three, and all the way to six in. This is the pattern that is made when we do this. You'll notice that there's a great symmetry here, which is part of the law of balance. Five, 
the point where we curve around in here. On either side of it is a four. Either side, beyond that again is a three. Beyond that is two, one. You see in going from four, you're going reverse direction here. There's like a mirror symmetry here. This is part of the secret, some would call in quotes, the secret of the design of this labyrinth. In the labyrinth at Amiens, the Amiens at Rams Cathedral or at uh, Chartres Cathedral, they also have a, a secret design using the numbers like this to apply an area in mathematics called topol topology. And in topology, um, it's a study of geometric forms independent of their size or their shape or in, in deforma deformation. In topology, a square is the same as a, as a circle because you can stretch, if you've got like a, if you can stretch the square in just the right way, you can get a, get a circle, for example. And so this is part uh, of the deeper meaning of the labyrinth uh, and the Pythagorean tradition. Here are the numbers that are being used to construct this. Indeed, if we, um, there's a topologist at the State University of New York named Anthony Phillips, and he's been able to reconstruct for uh, Roman mosaic labyrinths from ancient times where you just have fragments from them because from those parts, we know what the rest of them might have been, must have been. This is something that's also very important about the law of balance in a more expansive way. One of the great mathematicians of the 20th century was Emmy Nothering. She brilliantly created many of the major fields of math that we know of mathematics now. Later part of her career was in Vermont College in Pennsylvania. She faced a great deal of anti-Semitism uh, anti and, uh, and uh, sexism, but she, tri she truly triumphed. She was able to show the back of many of the laws in physics, laws of physics where there's conservation laws, whether it be conservation of electric charge or conservation of energy or conservation of momentum is fundamentally symmetries in their mathematical forms. So she, physicists are greatly updated and inspired by her because she showed them a much deeper sense of symmetry that's back of our, our existence. It took them much more deeper into the nature of the co cosmos uh, and actually much more the type of symmetry uh, that is part of the way that uh, the spiritual, uh, you could say by analogy, the spiritual and the physical realms are created. In terms of some of the final things I wanted to show you um, is about the infinite. That's where the outer self has a lot of challenges in grasping the infinite. You know that uh, it's something though that the inner nature or it's on the infinite plane has no trouble with. Thinking of the geometry that's associated with space, you know, in, we learned Euclidean geometry where there's no curvature at all. That's what you learned in public school. Um, it's flat. Now, if you travel on the earth though, there's a it's got a positive curvature. That's often why when you fly, say if you're flying from New York City to London, England, you might think, well, why aren't we just going straight across on this flat, like you'd see on a flat map, where are we starting to head up north? Uh, way up into the North Atlantic. Well, you measure different distance differently depending the space you're on uh, is positively curved, negatively curved, so forth. A saddle of a horse is an example of, of a negatively curved uh, two-dimensional space. Uh, um, Einstein used a negatively curved space, a hyper hyperbolic geometry to do the modern physics on it. Uh, the, an artist, uh, M.C. Escher, you may have enjoyed his works. Um, he was assisted in this work by a professor at uh, HSM Coxeter, who was a mathematician at University of Toronto in earlier years. The work's entitled Circle Limit for Heaven and Hell. In a way, it's an area, you can see it's finite in its, its nature, but in a certain sense, it's an infinite distance to the outer. Because in, in this uh, uh, negatively curved space, this hyperbolic geometry, you measure distance differently. One of my pure math professors used to do, give it by analogy, as you walk out here, it gets stickier and stickier, and you measure difference by the amount of effort you've got to make. And as you get further and further out here, it gets more and more effort till it's tending towards an infinite amount of effort to reach the outer, the outer ring there. He did it, uh, you'll notice here with heaven and hell symbolized by, if you look carefully, an angel here in white and a bat in black. It gives you a shift in perspective. One of the great mathematicians uh, from the late 19th century, early 20th century, 
was very interested in Rosicrucian studies was George Cantor. And he talked about uh, different concepts of infinity because someone, one might think, well, if infinity is infinity. Isn't there as many uh, numbers? Can you, if you can count things up infinitely, isn't that all there is to infinity? Well, it turns out, no, there's a lot more. And it's a challenging subject, but if one can get a taste of it, it can help in terms of our capacity to tune with the cosmic and have a deeper sense of spirituality because part and parcel of that is the nature of the infinite. Bear with me in a simple demonstration here. You know, if you remember the rational numbers you learned in school where they're like numbers like uh, you have a, a number in a numerator, or a number in a denominator, like one over one or one half or one third or one quarter or two fifths. Well, you can lay them out, all the numbers that have one in the numerator up across one row, all that have two the next row, and then it's increased the denominators by one unit as you go across. So you could list all, all the fractions this way and all them um, this way, uh, proper and mixed. And there's a way to count them up with natural numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can keep counting them. So all the fractions, they're, they're, they're countable too. Well, how about the, uh, the real numbers are count, where the real numbers countable, like all these decimals like this. Well, let's say you got a list of all the real numbers like this. You know, 0.2345 or 0.214 and so forth like that. Just can be an infinite list of them because there's an infinite number of real numbers. Um, you can say, well, you can always construct a number that is equal to the next number beyond what's the first place of the first number. So I say x 0 0.3, and then what's here? In the second row, the ones will add it, so you get two. From the third row is six, we add one, we get seven. We just keep going like this. And this number, because it's different from what the first row, because we made the, num the number in the first place, three different from here. And in the, in the second row, this second digit is different. We made it different too here. This number is different from every single number in this list. Therefore, you can't count up the real numbers. They're of a different order of infinity than the natural numbers which can be mind blowing. And when one first hears it, if one's not used to this and the outer self rails against this and gets displ possibly displeased and so forth because one thinks one understood infinity uh, enough. What uh, Cantor did was he's very spiritually inclined and he used the he Hebrew alphabet to say that, oh, the order of infinity or the what's called the carnality or the size of the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, you can count them up, is alpha no. And there's, then there's alpha one. And then there's C for that's the, the size of the, or cardinality of the real numbers, which might be alpha one or may not be. It's an undecidable question in mathematics. And then you can, you can actually say, create what's called the power set, which is a set of all subsets of say natural numbers. And it's gonna be two to the power, the, num the alpha or cardinality, which is an infinite number. So he created an arithmetic of uh, infinite numbers. And that's what's going to be alpha one, which maybe the cardinal of the real numbers or may not. But you can keep on creating higher and higher orders of infinity. And he viewed this as a way to be indicative of the divine or of God, or a way to try these higher orders of infinity are encompassed by God. This has led to very, a lot of inspiring work in mathematics and very astonishing things that um, the numbers that we count up one, two, three, four to infinity actually um, are not the highest order of infinity. The real numbers beyond that, and there's ones way beyond that as well. I'm going to do a few more things between we finish up. I want to talk about not only the infinite, but in Rosicrucian teachings, we learn about laws and principles and how they make sort out what can seem like a chaotic world or uh, our world that says, well, why are things happening the way they are? There must be a way of harmony and mastership. You can sort of symbolize that by thinking there's a tremendous amount of data and information that we get in our sense experience and in within us, we symbolize in this faction. If we could have some sort of key um, symbolized here, like it could be a law of laws and principles. This can be hard to penetrate, you know, to come to a deeper understanding and mature in your life. 
associated with the law of resistance because we have to demonstrate our worthiness, willing to learn what we need to know and unlearn things because an important part of learning is unlearning. In a way, that is to do with the subject of cryptography, which is part of mathematics. How do we uncode messages? Because you can look at all these things that we see around us and all these experiences as being like a cryptogram. If there's a system in order, what, what is the cipher? What's the key to break that? And there's traditional Rosicrucians like Dr. John Dee and Sir Francis Bacon and Thomas Jefferson who worked in cryptography and applied it in their, in their, wor in their work. Uh, and they uh, use that as an analogy for coming to mastership in life. One of the quickest ways to understand that is to remember back what prime numbers are, because these are things that are being used to encrypt information, like your credit card information. And it's keeping you secure in various ways in your computer. You remember prime numbers are numbers that are only divisible by one in themselves, natural numbers go like a number like two can only be divided by one in itself, three only one in itself, seven only one in itself. It's not divisible by two, for example. There's actually an infinite number of prime numbers. Say we can actually show that quickly by saying, say there was an inf a finite number of them, one up to say a hundred, which is n small n here, or a thousand. And we'll say there's just a finite number. We've gone a little bit after 5.30. I think we're gonna go about another uh, 15 minutes. So if it's okay for you, bear, bear with me. And uh, the, uh, say these are all the prime numbers, P1, P2, P3, up to Pn. This could be like two, three, five, seven, and so forth going up. There could be a thousand of them, a million of them, or more. Well, then we could say, well, let's construct a number, a number capital N that equals the product of all the prime numbers, because they're fine, we can finite number of them, and add one. Well, this isn't a prime supposedly, so it's supposed to be divisible by uh, the, some of these prime numbers. But it's not divisible by P1 because if you divide this number by P1, you get one left over, right? You get one left over, divide by two T, P2, you get one left over in the same way all the way through the PN, you get PN left over. But none of the primes divide capital N and there's, those were all supposed to be all the primes, so we got a contradiction. So we have a proof by contradiction that there's must be an infinite number of primes. And we've been using these larger and larger primes to do what's called public key encryption systems. Particularly if you multiply two huge primes together, that can help keep your credit card information uh, safe because if, if those who need to know the encryption method, they're only supposed to be privy to the information, um, know what the semi-prime, which is a, pro a product of two prime are, um, that in fact, which primes are used. The person who knows what the semi-prime is is trying to break the code. This would take them extremely long time to try to factor a product of two primes if they don't know what those primes are. And that keeps the information safe. And that's a way you can do a crypt modern cryptogram with something that seems very abstract like prime numbers from a subject area in mathematics called number theory. If you know the key and you know the cipher, so this is analogous to what we do in our Rosicrucian studies. We see cryptogram, everything seems complicated in our, in our lives. It seems like a, things are, uh, don't make sense. If we have the key in the cipher, if we've got the, like the Rosicrucian laws and principles, we can un uncode it, then we get the meaning and the understanding. Final thing I wanted to show you from mathematics briefly has to do with system and order, which is very important in mysticism. I mentioned earlier about self-reference. You know, increasingly in mathematics, it was thought over the centuries that it was something that was, a, it was an ideal subject, that it was, everything was well understood, uh, that it was, uh, shows an exemplar of system and order. Um, but things started to change, particularly in the 19th century into the 20th century. Um, there was old paradoxes uh, in philosophy that started to make their way into mathematics. There's a statement, for example, like this statement is false. Or, and you see, if that statement is true, then it's false. And if it's false, it's true. We've got a paradox here. And equivalently, the statement is unprovable. The same thing happens. 
this became an increasing challenge. This is something that some mathematicians, logicians, and philosophers such as uh, Al uh, Alfred North Whitehead or Bertrand Russell or Kurt Gödel knew. And Russell and Whitehead had tried to put standard arithmetic on a very rigorous foundation using what was called a theory of sets. But they realized that they, they couldn't do it. There was a conundrum. And part of it had to do with something that Russell related that, uh, whoops, that was related to these statements here that, that are paradoxes in a more technical way ring set theory. A set of all sets that are not members of themselves. When Russell saw that their project uh, to try to put uh, standard arithmetic, the type of arithmetic you learned in public school and beyond, that it was not complete. There was, there was statements in or theorems in um, standard arithmetic that were true, but you can't prove they're true. And a brilliant young mathematician here, Kurt Gödel, proved that dating from around 1930. And this result took mathematics, mathematicians aback we realize now that the math study of mathematics uh, had certain conundrums in it, but in a way from a mystical sense, that's not surprising because they, they try to do things simply from the, the self-conscious or the self, uh, the, the, um, that outer mind, it will lead to conundrums. It really needs the inner self or the cosmic mind to do with infinity and self-reference. Self this was taken even further uh, by Gregory Chaitin as a young boy he used to visit the New York Public Library in New York. And he took out a book that was based on um, Kurt Gödel's, what's called his incompleteness theorem. It's written by Nag Nagel and Newman. He tried to explain to other children and adults what it was. And that's something that inspired him from a young age. But he came up with a new concept of randomness. You see, when you learn probability theory, you can say, oh, if I'm flipping heads and tails, say like one's for heads, zero for tails, you flip them. And you can look at your, you see heads and tails, heads, heads, tails, just recoding them numerically as zeros and ones. If they're independent and it's a fair coin toss, the probability of getting a series of heads and tails like this and just getting all heads like this is equally probable because they're independent of each other and the probability of a half of each one, of a half of one. This though, most people would rail at that and say, well, just to get all ones like that, that can't be random. Uh, in classical probability theory, it is because they have the same probability of happening. But in information theory's viewpoint of randomness, it's different. This would not be random. And this is what Gregory Chaitin was inspired to do by the work of Kurt Gödel and others. He said that something is random if you can't compress it. You can't. Now here, this may be something that you can't compress because so maybe there was say a million towing costs. So you've got a million digits, ones and zero here. Um, if it's truly random, you're not gonna be able to compress it. To tell somebody though, you're gonna to have to give them all a million digits. If this is a million ones, you can just have a computer program that says, oh, print a million ones, which is very short. That's like having the Rosicrucian laws and principles and looking at all the complexity around you. It seems like something very complex, but it can be compressed in a much shorter amount of information by knowing the laws and principles. This was a brilliant deduction from uh, Gregory Chaitin, and it relates to Godel's result because with large, so you've got a large number that's random. You're not gonna be able to prove it's random. <laughs> um, so it's, an un it's undecidable. It's, uh, it's another area where, where our uh, mathematics is incomplete. What Godel, brilliantly did though, was he created a new subject called metamathematics, a language about mathematics. And that's what the inner self can do. It can do a language about the outer self uh, to give us understanding in our lives. In a way, and this is the last part for you, this relates to the vault of CRC that's in our tradition, um, where in the Fama Fraternitatis describes about the opening of the vault, which is said to be a compendium of the universe. And now all the Rosicrucian laws and principles are like that. It's like in our Rosa, our knowing our Rosicrucian laws of studies. Um, but having the laws and principles are like the complexity theory that was developed by uh, Chait. If you know them, you can make what seems a complex system very, very simple and understandable. All that variety around us is based on very simple laws and principles. 
Um, that leads us, and it's beautifully part of the concept of this was the philosopher Leibniz, who's an inspiration to change. He's depicted here uh, in this model of the, the vault designed by Jeff Hoke at the uh, Museum of Lost Wonder. I'll give you the reference for it. The references for this presentation will be given to you shortly in the group chat. Ultimately, this leads uh, to the rebirth of Christian Rosencrantz, which is idea, which is truly ourselves, the rebirth in our self, self mastery. Another way to look at that is where we began, is back with the liberal arts here. Eight in number, medicine has been added, and we've been dealing with various subjects to do with math and, and physics, geometry, and number that are symbolized here. As we use our reasoning capacity and our knowledge and use our emotions and our various aspects of ourselves in a, un in a unified way, we rise up to the center, the ladder, which is wisdom. And that is the purpose uh, of our presentation of a higher mathematical adventure into the Rosicrucian teachings, where you come to self-mastery by a balanced use of our emotions, our um, psychic capacity, our reasoning, um, mental faculties, our overarching spirituality. These are the various different phases of our being, the different phases of consciousness, all imbued with cosmic consciousness. And this is how uh, we come um, to wisdom and uh, the rose claw state. Thank you.